night, sweaty palms, prom night. Can you remember? Can you remember how the world received prom night and how you felt? I I actually don't remember. I, it was that far back, but I I do recall that I had shot a clear soap commercial and then a shoppers drug mart life shampoo commercial, and then I got that. Well, how did you get? How, how did you get that? That's the question. By oh. audition. Audition with with Paul or who did you? Um. Initially, I auditioned with my agent at the time, and then it just went from one thing to the next. Everything happened very quickly for me at that time in my career. Um, I don't recall meeting Paul until later. I was put on tape, that was it. Was the audition having had to do with you having to reenact your own demise at all? Was that part of it? No, I just was told that I should play as innocent and virginal as possible. So I had fun with that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's funny that Kelly is such an interesting character because you're on, you know, arguably the sauciest character in the movie. Let's put it right out there. You show the most glimpses of skin, and yet you are the most virginal character in the film, and yet you're the first one to get killed, which in these kinds of movies, again, as I mentioned, the virgin usually is triumphant. Uh, what are your memories of Jamie Lee? Um, she's an, an extraordinary woman, and we were all pretty young at that time. This is the heyday in, in the 80s. It was heavy-duty drug culture and so on. Um, and I think, for the most part, just filming in Canada was something that was quite big for everybody. And then so having stars up and so on. But Jamie and I are still friends. He's back. Uh -oh. I mean, you were so funny. Yeah, yeah. I haven't spoken to her in some time, but uh, she's fabulous. I mean, she's, she's, as everybody knows how incredible an actor she is. And without, she is any, without any ego, too, I guess, at this point, even though she was this rising scream queen star, she was kind of an it girl at that point, right? Very much so, yeah. Uh, Carl, I just want to ask you, um, again, a huge fan of your work, uh, but when I think of your, your, your work with Bob Clark, uh, Black Christmas, you know, and going back to children should play with that things. Uh, some of that movie music is, is crazy. Like children, it's just insane. In the opening credits of that movie alone, with the you're, it's music as a character and it's in your face. But one thing I know is from Prom Night, uh, even though you could easily have gone for the throat with the music, it's very subtle. Talk about your approach. Well, I think, you know, less is more. And also, when children shouldn't play with that things, thank you very much for your compliments. But we were using equipment that was very difficult to control. So sometimes it took off on its own and did things. And occasionally Bob Clark would be nearby. And he'd say, in the middle of, we're trying to fix it, these primitive synthesizers. And he'd say, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's what I want. So, but in prom night, we had much more control. We could slow it down. We could wait, and we had learned after doing two or three movies, one, you know, with Bob and with other people, that if you're trying to sucker punch the audience, wait. Right. Don't give it to them all at once, because then they won't believe it when it happens. Well, you should also, I should also mention that the music is not just your baby, but it's also, Absolutely. it's Absolutely. the work of you and, and Canadian composer Paul Zaza. Who also you kind of brought into the fold with Bob uh, at uh, with Murder by Decree. Uh, so was Paul's influence instrumental? Then in you kind of behaving yourself as a composer to some degree. Yes, I have to say he uh, he kept me a little bit more disciplined. He most ably and wonderfully produced the bulk of the disco music, and and I don't know if you noticed it, but we had a lot of control over that music. So sometimes in building tension, we didn't need score music. We just needed the pulsing of the disco music as heard in different locations near the disco. Right. Um, yeah, that, that, there's a lot of disco in this movie, absolutely. The prom night song, it's like the 12-inch mega mix remix of that tone. It just got, I think it's part of the beauty of the movie, is scenes just go on and on, past the point of comfort to the point where they become ludicrous and then surreal, and it's just absolutely great. Um, but, but I wanted to ask you about the film. I mean. Was, did the blood make you nervous? Did it make you sick? Did it 
freak you out? No. What was the, what was the prosthetic like? Because, I mean, it is an R-rated movie, so they didn't show too much, but that still looks like a pretty nasty wound. Sticky. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was fascinating to learn about it and, and to be in different positions and so on. I had a great time playing that. It was uh, just being able to focus and, and not breathe. Um, but there were gobs of blood and they kept adding more and more and then the scene where, right at the end where Eddie Benton, who's now Anne-Marie Martin, um, when she goes into the closet and my hand drops over and so on, my body flops over. I thought that was great. I had great fun. I don't particularly like to watch it, but I don't mind playing. Yeah, that, that's a question though. I mean, how does it feel to watch yourself dead on screen? Is it, is it a little bit neat, a little bit strange and surreal and unsettling? Um, over here. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a bit weird. Yeah, it was a bit weird. Well, it must be weird for your, your husband uh, who's here with you as well tonight to see, to see this too. I mean, it's just a, it's, I usually ask Scream Queens this and watching themselves die on screen. And it's fun to ask their mothers that question too because usually those are the ones that are hit the hardest. But it's also a strange phenomenon about horror movies in that. Um, People who, I mean, a woman comes on screen, she's very attractive, suddenly she gets murdered. And from that moment in history, that small moment in cinema history, suddenly you have a huge cult following that will follow you to your last days. Have you seen any evidence of the prom night uh, following, uh, following you through your career? Um, well, recently, um, having Michael Toff play Jamie Lee's brother, he was the actual killer. Um, and he has just wrapped up doing U.S. tours with um, Stacy Lee, and uh, who's, I believe, an agent of such tours down in the United States. And so she got quite excited, and, and there's now email conversation, and maybe I'll go down there and do another one. I feel like I'm having a William Shatner moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah I, would, I would like to say something about Leslie. Um, an absolutely hysterical man. I, you, I, he seemed did he, did he have the did he have the little fart machine back then? Back then he had it. Whoopee machine. Wow. And he would. He there was one scene, and unfortunately they cut it out. It was a scene where he was in the office with one of the actresses whom I recognized at the end, who played his secretary, and she was on the phone doing something. Um, and uh, talking to somebody on the phone, and Leslie was supposed to make his entrance at one point. Well, I was standing beside him, and we'd kind of become buds by then. I mean, he's a bit of a ham, and so am I. Uh, actually, he's a real ham. Um, and, of course, he had his whooping machine. So, with impeccable timing, he stood outside the room and let it go. Once, fired bit longer, and they were rolling, right? And she's sort of busy around the desk. <laughs> and he did it again. It was B, a couple of beats. And then a really long one, and beat. And then a short one, and she just, she just stopped. Can, can we stop, please? It's, it's, it's really beginning to stick in here. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just Leslie with his B. God rest his soul, man. Yep. Leslie was one of the greats for sure. Um, so yeah, that was surreal. Mary Beth and I were on the phone for like the first time the other day, and suddenly, as we were in mid-speech, an email pops up from the, from Stacy Lee saying, "Look, I'm looking for her. Would she want to do this convention tour and stuff like that?" So just strange how life works. Now I'm gonna put this out to you guys as we do have the time for some questions, uh, and I do have a bag of amazing prizes. Okay, so here's the way we're gonna do it because I want you guys to get up and use your voice. Uh, whoever asks a question gets a really good prize, all right? Ask a really good question, I'll give you two really good prizes, all right? So, any questions for the cast and uh, composer? Yes, sir. Where did you film in, in the restaurant? Uh, I think so, yes, yeah, Scarborough. There was, it was Donald Mills. Donald Mills. That yes. was like an actual high school? Yes, sir. I, I believe it still exists. I hope so. <laughs> That was still a good question. It was filmed at Don Mills. I mean, at that school, it was in a functioning school? Yes. Any other questions?
questions, yes sir. Did anything memorable happen at your own high school prom? Pardon? Did anything memorable happen at your own high school prom? And I presume it was prior to shooting this movie, yes? <laughs> Just, yes. Um, I, I can't tell you that. <laughs> I was on the stage most of my high school, and, and so I never really did that kind of thing. Get, get killed is what you're saying, you never really did that. Yes, yeah, okay, wait. How about Carl? Let's go back in the day. Okay, all right, all right, we'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, you know what, make my life easy, come on up and get your prize. All right, anyone else out there? Of course, yes, in the back. Say again, sorry? The Disco song? Yes. Is that song Yes. Okay, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about that. Yeah, I say the song was written by Paul and yourself, yes. yes? And it was used in Cabin Fever, the Eli Roth. That's correct. Yes, they licensed it. And we uh, were very happy to have it used again. So do you own the rights to the music? You, do, you own the rights to How does that work with all your scores? You managed no, to obtain the rights? You know, that's, that's, that's strange, though, because uh, Carl did the score for uh, Bob Clark's Death Dream, one of the great 70s horror films, Dead of Night, Death Dream. Uh, and Eli Roth has been attached to that to remake that film for a long time, so I don't know if that's a coincidence or what. Okay, you come get some prizes, then. Come on. All right. Come on, you got to work for it, man. Come on, let's go. Anyone else here? we still got some minutes, and we once in a lifetime, you're going to get these two sharing the stage with me in the center. Yes? I was wondering. Yeah, as Did you envision it as the end, to be like the end product was, or do you think it was going to be something How, how close to this movie, different? how close did it stick to the script? Is it pretty much the way you thought it would end up? Yeah, I would think so. Um, <laughs> as far as I recall, it was, uh, there wasn't a lot of improv, but it was, that's a long time ago, but I, I, I know that I would say 99% of the, the film uh, was the script itself. Yeah. And then it was just the creative nuances of Paul Lynch and uh, Bob Fresco and uh, Bob Moon, the DOP. Were you, were you surprised at the outcome? Or? Uh, I was surprised. Surprised, surprised in a good way? Or? Yeah, I was surprised in a good way. I mean, uh, it's having all that goo and it's glycerin, right, and, and so on, of, of the blood, and just, it's, it was a nice build-up. I mean, back then, it was relatively new, that type of genre, so, and I'm, I must say I was a bit young to appreciate it. I think I appreciate it more now, actually. So, yeah, watching the movie now, I guess you were saying the last time you saw it was in the 80s, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a big, again, another big hit on VHS. That's probably where most of us saw it on the AFCO Embassy at VHS back in the day. But watching it now in the big screen, I mean, how do you feel about it as a movie? I mean, obviously it's got its, its, its strengths and its weaknesses, but all, overall, how do you think it holds up? Be I'm honest. Uh, yeah, well, I'm impressed. I, I, I'm not too crazy about the color, but I suppose that's the print over time. Um, it had enough Hitchcocky in there. It, it's so age specific with the disco and so on. I'll never forget that tune. <laughs> um, and uh, it's got a certain. Well, again, it, it, it's very age specific. Um, it, it's definitely in the late 70s, early 80s, and, and it's, that's it. It really is. It's the last, it's the first gasp of what would be the, the slasher boom, really. The first, you know, the first body count gasp of the 80s, but it's also the last gasp of the 1970s, period, right? I think. I think so. I think after that, people were wearing the disco sucks buttons, right? I mean, that was it. What I, did, I hadn't remembered this is that uh, I, I, I had forgotten it, that I don't know what character said it, but somebody said fuck. And was there a fuck in there? I don't think yeah, yeah. so. I think Oh, of course, Lou said it, yes. Who is, wait, 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 stop that, right? Who is Lou? Who is that actor? Where is Lou? Yeah. He's what? David Mucci, M-U-C-C-I. 
Where can we find Lou these days? I don't know. I tried to find him myself. Uh, dead in the ravine somewhere. <laughs> I, th I think. I think. You know. I think we got to find Lou for one of these conventions. I think he'd be sort of like the holy grail of prom night uh, fandom. Is to find friggin' Lou, put him in that shirt, get him out, get him out there. Uh, Carl, I just want to ask you too further further to your question about the way the movie turned out. I mean, I think. It, you know, the great composers and the great directors, Leone, Morricone, uh, but th that's obviously not in play here. This is no uh, Sergio Leone film, but I w did, not quite. But did, how early did you come on board in the production? Were you there from the script or were you there the final product? I was there before the film was shot because they needed all that disco music. Right. That disco music had to be done before the fact, although many movies are done where they don't do it before the fact. But I was very happy to see after how many years is it or decades that the dancers actually looked at sync and that's because that was the music we used yeah. on set well, not always in it. that specific spot to shoot it but that was the piece we used for those scenes so we now had to get the vote before the fact yeah that is actually really rare you, you rarely see that through editing sometimes it'll just jam together this, i'd like to say this that peter simpson had a lot of foresight and he also had something else that many people don't have he had the ability to let us alone to do it and for that i'll always be grateful to him he didn't micromanage you he trusted no, your he instincts did. yeah that is rare uh, do we have any final questions here before we pack it in for the night and put the house lights on? Yes, ma'am. So, um, how physical are the movie directors being? Well, this man was in safe in a studio somewhere. <laughs> but Mary Beth, who, did anyone get hurt? Was there any serious risk for anyone's health? I don't think so. It was a really professional set, as I remember. Paul Lynch never slept. Uh, he would have been the only injury, I think, uh, uh, at the time, but uh, no, everybody was a pro, and as I can remember, it was a totally pleasant experience. Everybody was a team player, and um, I don't remember any injuries. I'm sorry, shall I make one up? I have yes. to tell you, <laughs> Wait, was there an injury in the studio there? Well, I have to say, I saw Paul Lynch. Uh, several months ago, and he still hasn't slept. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul Lynch went on to a pretty illustrious career in television. I mean, you name it, he's probably shot it, right? Yeah. Um, listen, guys, is there any final words? Do you have anything you want to say about the film? Any, anything? Very Prom good. night is all right. Prom night is all right. It's going to be all right. Well, right. 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 listen, um, Carl, Mary Elizabeth, you know, this is great. We should dig up more movies that you worked on together. Or maybe you should just go out there and make a new movie together so we can reunite and come up here and do this. That's what we're going to have to do because I don't think we did the movies together except for this one, did we? No, so I guess it's time. Well, we're going to have to do this. Any other questions before we pack it in, guys? And I do have your prizes. Don't worry about it. Both of you, you can come up and see me afterwards. Anything else? Okay, I got a, one more little prize here. Last question here. I mentioned this is Leslie Nielsen's uh, perhaps last serious dramatic role before he became Frank. It was a Drebin uh, in the Naked Gun movies. But there was one last great horror movie he did where he was very serious and very intense and very scary. Does anyone know that movie? Yes. Day of the Animals. Which one? Day of the Animals. That predated Day. Day of the Animals was prior to this, was it not? Because I'm thinking of one more. Afterwards. afterwards, one more. Sorry. <clears throat> yes. I gotta go for the hand. I was the hand gonna say? Creep show. Yes, and some of you all say. Yes, creep show. But to me, that's the definitive Leslie Nielsen performance. Okay, thank you very much for coming out to Film School Confidential next month's Shivers. Thank you to Mary Elizabeth Rubens, and thank you to Carl for coming out and having fun. Have a good night. <laughs>